It's no secret that Stanley Kubrick's floor plan of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining is rather peculiar. Its spatial logic is purposely illogical with doors, windows, and hallways, not where they should be, not where they can be. We'll explore deeper with both the in-film lore and how it affects the viewer experience. Fans of Kubrick and his infallibility will prefer the first, while skeptics may likely be more interested in the latter. This is where I say, the alternative theories mentioned within may cause anxiety, rage, or disbelief. But that's why you're here, I hope. Consider leaving a like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this video. Now, let's look into our monitors and see what's around that corner. Remember, there are no continuity errors, only Kubrick's deliberate masterpieces. Hi, I've got an appointment with Mr. Allman. My name's Jack Torrance. His office is the first door on the left. Thank you. First up, Ullman's impossible window. Enthusiasts have carefully followed Jack's walk from the front desk to Stuart Ullman's office and notice how the window behind the desk just can't be there. According to the supernatural floor plan, it should be a wide hallway that runs behind the elevator lobby to the kitchen, not a bright window. We can see the hallway in the background before Jack exits left and up into Ullman's office. When Danny takes his tricycle, he takes the path near the window, banks left, past the elevators, and into the kitchen. Ullman's window is non-existent. What does this mean for the in-film universe? How would this affect the lore? The first question is, how many would notice? Would guests realize it? How about the staff that does the same thing over and over again? Just like the viewer who may not have noticed the first time watching, it goes by unassumed. But what if those very intimate with the Overlook have noticed the spatial anomalies, those like Ullman or Halloran? Halloran, after all, tells Danny to stay out of room 237, for that room seems a bit too large on the inside. Perhaps Halloran knows too well. This could be why Ullman requested Watson to sit in on the interview with Jack. Maybe he was gauging if Jack noticed or is the type to notice the strange phenomenon sometimes experienced in the hotel. Ullman is the type to show his cards, like he literally shows his hands, but he's not one to read them for you. He sits in front of an impossible window and waits for Jack to come out and say there's something not right. Instead, Ullman distracts him with a gruesome story, too gruesome to worry about rooms in interdimensional spaces. One theory I have heard long ago, that Kubrick was trying to make the audience feel subconsciously uncomfortable, experiencing broken spatial logic. With the camera following Jack from the front desk into the office, we are sure this clue to the audience was deliberate. While I can't attest how it affected me subliminally, Consciously, it's something easily missed. I'm not just talking about the floor plan, but the difference between a tracking shot and a subtle jump cut. We see this. Jack makes his stroll to the office and sits down and the interview begins. Kubrick gives us the clues, although we may not be prepared to notice it. What if, from the front desk, we substitute the dead footsteps with a jump cut? and go straight to the handshake. I doubt most viewers will remember the difference between one or the other. For first time watching and the one and done crowd, there are no changes to the overt messaging. Ullman still gives his explanation of what happened to Grady. Jack gives us the same limited backstory about his writing project. That doesn't mean the lore isn't there for us to discover. Once we do, we realized Jack was walking into something creepy. I don't necessarily see this as an attempt to jar us subliminally. I do see this as a clever foreshadow. What about this film opening is so outstanding? We see Jack rounding corners, takes a seat, and begins his work at the Overlook. In the end, we see Jack rounding corners, takes a seat, and begins his work at the Overlook. Fifteen rib roast, 
30 10 pound bags of hamburger. We got 12 turkeys, about 40 chickens, 50 sirloin steaks. Next, the incredible freezer door. Dick Halloran's tour of the kitchen includes the longest possible path he could think up, sort of like walking through the maze outdoors. As he takes Wendy and Danny to the first freezer door, if you look closely, he opens the door with his left hand, pulling on the handle that is on the right of the door from looking at it from the hall. When the door opens, however, we see he had used his right hand with the handle on the left of the door. When Halloran steps out, the handle is indeed on the left, not right, as they return to the kitchen. So what happened in front of us? We see Halloran escort Wendy and Danny through the kitchen. They walk past the chef's office and the chalkboard. When Halloran closes the door after showing off the room of frozen body bags, the three return to the kitchen. The chalkboard is on Halloran's right. The chef's kitchen is on his left. With help of these clues, we see exactly the freezer door they first approached. Keeping with the idea that there are no continuity errors, only Kubrick's deliberate direction, this may be evidence of the supernatural. It is certainly subliminal. What made this transition exceptionally clever was the use of a graphic match cut. A graphic match is an editing technique whereby one scene transitions into another by use of similar visual cues. Often the transition from one place in time to another is very evident without ambiguity. We see it in The Shining as well, where the luggage the Torrances bring with them dissolve into another pile of suitcases, scavenged and picked up by a group of guests. But this graphic match was so extremely deceptive, it went almost unnoticed. The visual similarities comes with the group of three, the camera just outside the silver colored door to us, seeing the three from a camera inside the freezer. The second cut gave us what we expected to see visually. But is this an example of supernatural forces? It depends if you believe the transition was a match or a jump cut. A match cut is an editing technique from one shot to another for a seamless transition within the same space and time. It's very common in film media. Examples seen in The Shining include when Wendy and the doctor steps out of Danny's room and into the hall, when Jack throws the tennis ball, and when Jack takes a seat at the bar. The two cuts making the match cut are from two different angles, covering the same moment of time with a smooth transition. It is assumed that the in-film time that elapsed between the two cuts would be a single frame or a fraction of a second. Applying the same assumption when Halloran first reaches for the freezer door, one twenty-fourth of a second later, we see from the inside the freezer in a seamless transition. Same can be said when Halloran closes the door. This would mean the three teleported down the kitchen hall and stepped back out of a different freezer. To make it more baffling, not one of the three noticed. However, an alternative theory would be that this was a jump cut. A jump cut is an editing technique from one shot to another with pieces of footage removed to make it appear there was a jump forward in time. What if instead a fraction of a second between Halloran pulling on the handle and seeing inside the freezer? It was three minutes later. Whole conversations and a tour of the first freezer was excluded. The audience is fast forwarded to the second freezer and left out of prior moments. There is an example of a jump cut without using a dissolve, where Jack has his conversation with the bartender Lloyd. Wendy runs into the gold room as Jack seems to be in a stupor. It is ambiguous how much time had passed since the prior close-up of Jack. Why would Kubrick do this? For one, it's a pretty neat trick, and it lets us know that maybe we can't always believe our lying eyes. This is our famous hedge maze. It's quite an attraction around here. The walls are 13 feet high, and the hedge is about as old as the hotel itself. Finally, the bizarre hedge maze. It's been long pointed out that the maze doesn't quite match the sign that doesn't quite match the model. The wooden bulletin board the map was posted to 
is seen in different places or disappears entirely. Wendy and Danny are shown walking from one dead end to another. One of the more glaring continuity bending differences is the maze entrance. It's first seen facing away from the overlook to being directly across. Danny is seen running straight to the maze's entrance rather than running along the side, like earlier with his mother. An interesting theory is Danny's power of the shining allows him to change the maze within. Dead ends can be opened, walls can be moved, the paths in, out, and throughout change accordingly. While we see a literal interpretation of how Danny fools Jack, it may be a symbol of how Danny traps Jack, who is unable to find his escape. I have little in-film lore theory to explain the moving and disappearing poster. My pragmatic view is the poster was moved or eliminated depending on what made better cinematography for a specific scene. If I had to come up with one, I'd say we were looking at the maze during different ages, a snapshot in time where the sign didn't exist or moved in front of the entrance or placed against one of the walls. Within the maze, time may not be linear. When we see Wendy and Danny walk through in daylight, there is no sign of the hotel or anything besides the clouds to help orient them. Perhaps Jack's final fate, trapped in the maze, is representative of being trapped in time. The Outlook Maze is a loop where there is no beginning nor end. This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, if you're bored out of your mind, write a book. All you need is a title. Check out other videos on the channel. Thanks for watching.